Hello, everybody. As Mauricio, Mauricio mentioned, my name is Diego Fernandez. I'm the Secretary of Innovation of the City of Buenos Aires. And uh, I will share with you basically how we were dealing, how we were planning with self-sovereign ID approach. And how do we got to the point that we are right now. So I'm going to share with you Quark ID, which is a self-sovereign ID protocol that we promoted. But let me start thinking about how do we deal with identity in the analog world. Let's think for a second about our wallets. In our wallets, we have a chunk of attestations of our identity. Maybe we have a driver's license. In my case, I have ID from two different countries, Uruguay and Argentina. I have a credit card from two different banks. I have a card from my health insurance company. I have a card from my football soccer team, River. All of those institutions gave me attestations that make my identity. All of those institutions don't know that the other institution gave that credential to me. Nevertheless, all of them agree on a set of given standards, which is quite basic. It's the height and the width, and the width of, of the credentials. And why is that? because we have our own wallets. We have our wallets, I have a black wallet, and maybe each and every one of you chose a different color of wallet. We choose the wallet that we want, and we put the credentials in the wallet that we choose. And how do the verification of this credential works in the analog world? It follows this triangle over here. The most important part of this triangle is the line that says trust in the base of the triangle. And why is that? Because let's say, for example, that the Buenos Aires city government issues a driver license on my behalf, stating that I am able of driving a car. Then a policeman stops me and says, hey, show me your driver's license, please. That when I showed my credential, the policeman needs to trust the Buenos Aires city government, needs to know how the Buenos Aires city government makes credentials in order to be able of verifying that the credential is valid and it is not a forge. But let's think of the last 30 years when internet took over and we became digital. How do we deal with identity in the digital world? Well, we have a huge problem there. Why? Because we don't have yet a digital ID primitive. And I'm really excited that I think that this is starting to change, that we are starting to build a digital ID primitive. But today, and we are all familiar with this, in order to ensure, let's say, a bank, uh, an insurance company, or whatever, in order to be sure that the other party is who we think we, it is, each company needed to make their own security frameworks, their own security approach. Hence, we have tons of apps in our, in our cell phones. We have an app for the bank, an app for the government of the, of the national government, an app for the local governments, apps for the health companies, apps for the airlines. Taking this into the analog perspective would be the same as... Uh, hey, sorry, I, I don't have a timer here. Huh? No, tengo, no tengo el, el timer. Sorry. Going back. Uh, comparing this to the, analog, to, to, to the analog model would be the same as if when the Buenos Aires City government gives you a driver license, the driver license came in a wallet that says Buenos Aires City government. When Visa gives, gives you a, a credit card, comes in a physical wallet that says Visa, and you will, we, will, we would be carrying a bag full of wallets. It doesn't make sense in the analog world, but we do it in the digital world. We have pages and pages of, app in, of apps in order to be enabled of interacting with any given organization. What is the great advantage that the self sovereign digital ID model proposes? As you see, conceptually, it's quite the same model of trust that we have in the analog world. But it's much, much better. Why? Because as you see in the base, that trust line is not more a solid line. And why is that? Because a blockchain comes into place. And we go into, in deep into this in the next few slides. The issuer creates a digital identifier and writes that digital identifier with its associated cryptographic materials needed to decode it in a public blockchain. 
When the issuer means a verified credential to the wallet of any given holder, the holder is first able of accepting or rejecting the wallet. And this is really important in this model. Nobody can airdrop or give a credential to a user if the user doesn't accept the credential. When the verifier requests a, a digital proof of that credential, this request is claims-based, not credential-based. Let's say I have three daughters, 19, 17, and 15 years old. Of course, when I go to a bar and request a beer, nobody asks for my ID because any, anybody assumes that I'm over 18. But that's, that's not the case of my daughter. In, in today, in the analog world, we have a credential-based uh, authentication or verification. So we give, for example, my daughter, when she requests a beer in a bar, she is forced to give all of her information, all of the information contained in, for example, her ID card to a waiter handing, handing her a, a beer. In this self sovereign ID model, it's only claims based, and you can give proof of certain aspects of your identity without needing to reveal all of the claims containing a given verified credential. So, for example, my daughter could just send a proof to the waiter that she's over 18, not giving her name, not giving her address, not giving what any other characteristic of her persona. And as that proof contains the digital identifier of the issuer, the verifier doesn't need to trust or to make no integration whatsoever with the issuer because the verifier is able of checking in the blockchain that the verified credential is valid and that, the, that it was signed and created with the private keys of the issuer. So what goes on chain and what goes off chain? And this is really, really important. The only thing that goes on chain is the digital identifiers and the associated cryptographic needed to understand that digital identifier. They are on your right hand side. You can see what the structure of a, any given digital identifier the Quark ID model has. Every verified credential, every, every personal data goes off chain. Every personal data is stored in the user's personal device. In the Quark ID protocol, we are using a, an open source wallet. That open source wallet is non-custodial. And everybody asks me at this point, hey, what happens if I lose my wallet, my phone? Well, you have two choices. If you were, if you were safe enough of storing your private keys and backing up your confidential storage, then you will be able of recreating your digital identity wallet immediately. If you didn't do that, you're in the same situation that you are today in the analog world. You need to go again to each and every institution or organization that gave you a birth a credential and request that credential again. <laughs> I'm going to do a quick review of the four layers that the Quark ID protocol has following the Quark, the Trust Over IP Foundation model. In the level one is the blockchain level, the, the distributed ledger level. It's where we write every digital identifier so that it's available to anyone in the world that wants to verify it. In the layer two, we deal with the peer-to-peer -peer communication, with the Asian communications. In this uh, a scenario that we were thinking before, when a waiter comes to my daughter and says, hey, are you 18 years old? He will establish a peer-to-peer -peer communication with no agent in the middle whatsoever. This is based on the DITCOM protocol, which is an evolution of the hyperledger areas. The third level re re relates to how do we deal with proofs, claims, and credentials. What is the way that we interact with those proofs, claims, and credentials? And the layer four is the ecosystem level. It's where we store, where we sort of announce all of the issuers, all of the entities available or authorized in order to issue credentials. One very interesting thing about the Trust Over IP model is as each layer of this technology stack has a governance stack as well. I'm not going to go into the governance stack. I invite you to go into the Trust Over IP model, uh, Trust Over IP Foundation website, because it's a really interesting approach. So let's go in deep into Quark ID. How do, how, how do we envision Quark ID? We had, of course, the chance of saying, hey, let's, we're a government, let's go and do this government implementation, let's make 
the Buenos Aires Self Sovereign ID Protocol. But we're convinced that that's not the way to go. Why? Because we're convinced that the way that governments interact today with society need to change. We believe in open, permissionless blockchains, and we believe that any, gov any protocol created by the government wouldn't be trusted. Just let me ask you a question. Would you trust a protocol created by the government? No. Okay, I wouldn't either. So what we did is we called... Argentina has a very big and very thriving community of developers, of companies, of projects. Most of you for sure know uh, Open Zeppelin, Decentraland, Sandbox, uh, POAP with Patricio, uh, RSK, IOP Labs. I mean, I can keep on mentioning we have a really strong, really strong Ethereum community in Buenos Aires. So we called all of these guys and said, hey, you know what? We're going to pursue this goal. Why don't you help us? Why don't you help us develop in this? And that call was pretty successful, and we started building Quark ID. And one of the definitions that we, the, one of the first definitions that we made is this mustn't, this shouldn't be a government protocol. This should be a community protocol. So you have a white paper on the internet, it's an open source protocol. It follows the standards that I mentioned here, the Centralized Identity Foundation, the W3C, Trust Group Foundation, and we decided to implement within the protocol compatibility with the OpenID Connect because of the huge uh, possibilities that that, in, that implementation brings us. And of course, if we are envisioning the self-sovereign ID model it, as, a, as a way of identifying ourselves, not in Buenos Aires, not in Argentina, but in planet Earth, we need to be compatible with all of the implementations that are being developed around the world. The most important of them all, perhaps, the ID Union, which is the self-sovereign ID model that the ID Union is proposing with the NGI Lab. <clears throat> sovereign, which is the, the, perhaps the first self-sovereign ID model which was developed, and ION, which is uh, an implementation developed by Microsoft over the Citrix Modena protocol. Quark ID is also developed over uh, Citrix Modena protocol. So, how does Quark ID works? Imagine Quark ID as a, as a self-sovereign ID layer. It's like a layer that goes on top of any given blockchain. So the we needed, as I mentioned before, in the layer one of the trusted RP model, we needed we need a distributed ledger blockchain. The first blockchain which we anchored the the Quark ID product was Ethereum layer, layer one. We made that uh, that anchoring not envisioning to use really Ethereum as a, as a security layer because of, of the gas cost, which will make it impossible to mean, for example, you know, one million credentials. But anchoring the protocol in, in, layer, in Ethereum layer one made it extremely easy to anchor it in any EVM compatible blockchain. The second thing that we did is we took the ION implementation that Microsoft made of the Cytri Morena protocol using Bitcoin layer one. Hence, you can use Quark ID anchored in Bitcoin layer one. And then we started with the layer two world. The first implementation that we made is Polygon. The second one that we made is RSK. RSK is an EVM compatible blockchain which anchors itself in Bitcoin. And the last one was Starknet. As you can see, the, the vision in Quark ID is this protocol needs to be chain agnostic. And that is a for us, it's a crucial definition. We're planning on adding different anchoring blockchains so that any ecosystem that decides to implement Quark ID may choose whichever security layer they wish. We, as the city of Buenos Aires, decided that the first implementation, that the first anchoring blockchain that we, uh, that we would use is Starknet. Why did we chose Starknet? Well, because their, their CK proof technology is pretty sound and it enable us to do a huge scaling because we can do a, a quadratic scaling. We sort of scale transactions in Starknet and then we scale transactions in Quark ID. Hence, we're able of using the self-sovereign ID protocol, the Quark ID protocol with not even cents on the dollar for minting hundreds of thousands of credentials. That is extremely important for us. So, as I mentioned before, 
we developed this and we were able of achieving this with a strong set of partners. Extremian, which is a, a dev house uh, located in, in Gibraltar. Starkware, which is a, a blockchain that you probably all know, based from Israel. IOF Labs, uh, which are the creators of RSK, Beyond, uh, OS City, XCapit, etc. A very important thing. What is the roadmap for Quark ID in Buenos Aires City? We're rolling out the MVP in November this year. We're launching the protocol in January 2023. And what is our, our adoption plan? We hope to create 30 different verified credentials that mean 30 different documents, let's say birth certificate, marriage certificate, driver's license. So we have a roadmap of 30 different verified credentials. And we plan to mint between 300,000 and 500,000 digital identifiers, that means digital identities, within 2023. Just to give you an idea, <clears throat> Buenos Aires is a 3 million, sorry, <clears throat> 3 million city, 3 million people city, but actually we're a 7 million people community. Why? Because we have nearly between 3 and 4 million people that commute every day to work in Buenos Aires. So we, we plan to start in 2023 having between 300 and, five, uh, 300 and 500 thousands, sorry, I speak English as a second language. <laughs> and uh, we would like as well to have, and we are looking forward to that, three different private sector uh, organizations using this security framework to mint their credentials. This is very important. Nobody needs to ask permission to any government to use this. Any given organization may mint their credentials without requesting permission from anyone. And any, any community in the world can use this protocol for free because it's an open source protocol. So Quark ID in a nutshell. First, it's an open standard self-serving ID protocol. Second, it's multi-chain. Third, it's interoperable with most of the solutions tackling digital ID in the world. Fourth, every private, private data is off-chain. Five, it's, it's going to have autonomous governance. Uh, I'm going to do a small point here. Today, the governance is being made by this ecosystem of partners. But in the protocol roadmap is generating a DAO in the next 24 months so that the protocol is being able of getting governed by the ecosystem of, I mean, communities, partners, or whatever using the protocol. This, of course, is a very hard and, and difficult thing to tackle. We have all seen the problems with coin voting, etc., and it's something that we're working quite hard on it. Six, we're creating, or Quark ID is creating a growing public-private ecosystem and seventh, and this is the most important point, the government is a user. We don't want users of the government. We want to be users as a government. And this is a change of paradigm, which for us is quite important. So last but not least, why did we choose this path? What is the dilemma that we face when we tackle digital ID? Are we going to prove positives or are we going to prove negatives? What I mean by this? A soulbound token is a negative proof. It's something that you can, you can say no, that you receive, and that proves certain negative aspects of you. I mean, for example, you don't have, credit, uh, you don't have credits, uh, outstanding credits. You don't have criminal records or whatever. Proving positives is what I just described with, in the birth rate credentials model, which is data that you have in, and that you can show or not according to your will. In our view, both things are necessary and both things will occur, but self-ownership and positive reputational systems come first. We need to develop what I was mentioned before, this identity primitive that we don't yet have. On top of that, of that identity, negatives will unleash a great power. Of course, and, and that great power would be immense for disenfranchised community, which will be able of 
requesting loans, for example, just using the reputation as a collateral. But it has certain potential negative things that we, are, we don't think that we are yet in a position to sort of deal with. Just to give an example, if I have a, pos a negative reputation that I'm, for example, a woman or that I am attending a mosque in the United, Sta in, in United States, that person will have 68% chance of not getting a job compared with a Christian woman. Uh, I took this out of the podcast of uh, Evan McMillan and Vitalik Buterin, which I strongly recommend you all to hear because it's, it's, it's really, really interesting. So, thank you very much. Uh, I invite you all to get into the quarkid.org uh, website, download the white paper, and we hope that in the next, I don't know, let's say 30 days, 60 days, we will have the code available in, in GitHub and published in the, the Quark ID website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Diego. We have some time for uh, questions. Anyone have a questions? There, there is one. Two questions, yes. Three questions, come on. Four. Oof. Oh, okay. The, the first one. Uh, can I mail you in Spanish or in English? I think. Okay, my friend. Um, I am uh, Vladimir from Ecuador. Uh, I think the concept for uh, solvable tokens and so self sovereign um, identity will converge in, a, in some point. Completely, what do you think? I completely agree. I completely agree. I think, uh, I think that solvable tokens and verified credentials are two different aspects of our, of our identity. The positives, the verified credentials, are the things that I, I mean, that conform my identity. The soulbound tokens reveal cert certain social interactions, horizontal attestations, that of course will unleash a huge potential. The thing is that, in our view, we need to start with the verified credentials model and then evolve into the reputational aspects that the Soulbound token proposes which, and then we will because those are all all of those are on chain and once you write something in a blockchain it's written forever so we need to deal first in our view with the verified credentials and the, the, the digital identity in a self-sovereign id model and then move to the Soulbound tokens uh, proposal proposal next question there please so uh, great great talk i really like thank it thank you very much um, who helped you on building that strategy? Sorry? Who helped you on building the strategy for this project? And who helped you on the vendor selection? Who helped on what, sorry? To find the right vendors like Polygon and the others. Who helped you to find the right protocols and partners? Well, uh, actually we did this with the, with the set of partners that, that, that I mentioned before, with the guys with, from Extremian, from the guys with uh, IOB Labs, from the guys that, with the guys of uh, Beyond. Uh, with a lot of help, and I want to mention this, with a lot of help from the Ethereum Foundation, from Maya, from Steven, from Skylar, and how did we choose in which uh, pr uh, blockchains to anchor? Well, of course, as I mentioned before, we started with Ethereum because it was a no-brainer. And uh, I was lucky enough, I mean, we were lucky enough of being able of chatting and, and, and discussing with, I mean, in, uh, I would say every big player in the blockchain arena and they were more than willing and open to share the details of their protocol and to offer support for us and, 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 and I feel very proud about that. At the end of the day we decided to anchor the city of Buenos Aires in StarkNet because of the hope that they provided us and because we really believe in their technology and we think that zero knowledge proof technology unleashes uh, a whole deal of implementations in a self-sovereign ID model which we want to take. Next question here, and there is some hands there and there. Can you hear me? Yeah. So thank you so much for the presentation. And then as a Latin American, I'm thinking about the user experience. So I imagine my family or my friends using verifiable credentials for reputation or um, any other use cases. But my question is, what is your roadmap or user experience? Like if I lose my phone, are you thinking about other ways that I can recover my wallet? Um, are you thinking about an other ways to store the verifiable credentials? Because in Latin America, for example, WhatsApp usage is huge, but people sometimes don't have a lot of storage to store different apps, so it's better to just have WhatsApp for them. So 
I'm just wondering, what are your thoughts and user experience in general for these use cases? Okay, just, I, I cannot get who's speaking. Could you please raise your hand? Oh, here. <laughs> Thanks. Well, it's a very good question. I mean, user experience, when you're planning in millions of people implementations are the, the thing that you need to deal with. I always like to say that we are giving you this possibility with this protocol. First, you can use, we, we're starting with three different wallets. The Quark ID protocol wallet, Xcapit is building, and in, which is a crypto wallet, is building an implementation for the Quark ID protocol. And OS City has a digital identity wallet that is also being made compatible with Quark ID. As I said before in my talk, you are able, if you have the technical knowledge, I mean, if it's not technical, I mean, if you go to settings and you export your private keys, so you store your seed phrase in whichever place you wish, and you do a backup of your confidential storage, let's say you put it in your Google Drive or you take it out in a pen drive or whatever, then if you lose your phone, nothing happens. You take your private keys, you recreate your wallet, you take your confidential storage, you sign it with your private keys, and then you have your wallet, your digital wallet, online, online, in your phone again. Of course, if you don't have that knowledge, you will need to go again to each and every one of the mint of the issuers of your credentials and request a reissue. The same way that you, when you lose a physical wallet today, you need to recreate all of, the, all of those documents. In our view, we're really focused on giving users the best experience whatsoever and start sort of a sharing how users may backup and safeguard their own data. In our view, those, I mean, the share of people knowing how to backup their data will increase over time. And we hope that in the next few years, everybody will do it. I, <laughs> each time I get this question asked, I share a personal experience that I have. I, have, I am 50 years old. My mother, something like 30 years ago, said, you know what, son, he was 60 something, I wanna, Learn to use the computer. Will you show me how? So I say, okay, sit with me. Grab your mouse and put it in the start button. It was a Windows 95. So, so she took the mouse. And she she did like this in the screen. Said, you know what, matter so now. <laughs> you need to get a. You need to get somebody. I cannot teach you. Today, my if she hears me, she will tell me. But today, my 83-year-old mother uses WhatsApp, does FaceTime, uh, sends mail, uh, configures her own email. I mean, 30 years passed, but. Uh, we are positive that people will get to understand web free and we think that we have the power as a government of onboarding a lot of people into web free technologies and that is using the power for good in my humble perspective. Thank you very much Diego and thank, thank you, you all for your questions. If you want to ask anything else, he likes to talk a lot.